Okay, so uh, welcome everyone, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, thanks, Angela, for your introduction. Um, so I think, as most of you know, uh, I was born in Australia, Adelaide, Australia, and what I intend to do this morning is to tell you a little bit about uh, how things were at that time in structural biology, how I got into protein crystallography, um, and uh, just compare a little bit how things were and how things are now. So what you may not know is that uh, Adelaide in Australia happens to be the birthplace, uh, the birthplace of W.L. Bragg. So this is um, Bragg the son, the, the, the Bragg's law Bragg. And um, at that time, uh, well, obviously he was born there because his father uh, had a position in Australia. And the circumstances were a little different. Uh, so Bragg, the father, uh, graduated from the University of Cambridge at age 23. He had a degree in mathematics, and he applied for, uh, and he was offered the position at the University of Adelaide of head of both the mathematics department and the physics department. And this was the tradition at that time. So these young people, mostly young guys, uh, would graduate and they would go off to uh, remote parts of the British Empire uh, and take up these faculty positions. So, as I said, Bragg was only 23 and he was going out to be head of these two departments but his own uh, degree was in mathematics. And apparently this issue came up uh, during the interview, and he said, but, you know, I have some experience in mathematics, but I'm also suspect expected to be the head of the physics department at the University of Adelaide. And the members of the interview committee said, not to worry, it's a long boat trip out to Australia. On the boat, you can learn enough physics uh, to pass muster with those colonials out there. So at any rate, he went to uh, the university, uh, had a tremendous teaching load, had to teach uh, multiple classes in physics for the first year, second year, third year students, same thing in mathematics. Uh, he was active in many um, non-campus activities. He started the Adelaide Lacrosse Club, for example. Uh, but for reasons that I won't go into, uh, he, at age about 40, 41, he began to carry out a research program. And once he did that, he was very successful. Um, but one of the difficulties at that time was that if you had written or if you had done some interesting piece of work, you wrote it up, you couldn't submit a manuscript directly to the journal, that you had to have a mentor, someone uh, who was already established to whom you could send the manuscript, that person would say, yes, this should be published, uh, and he would then send it to the journal. So um, Bragg, having done one of these uh, early experiments, uh, had written this work up, and the person that he knew uh, and was his uh, sort of mentor was Rutherford. Rutherford originally came from New Zealand at that time. Rutherford was in Canada, and later he was, of course, to move to Cambridge himself. Um, and so Bragg sent this manuscript to Rutherford uh, and then waited for the reply. And I'm going to just read you uh, a little bit that Bragg said later uh, about waiting for, to hear what had happened to his manuscript. Um, here we have uh, Bragg the father and, and Bragg the son, and this is this uh, recollection from Bragg written in 1904 about his manuscript. So Bragg says, so I wrote to Rutherford in Canada. It seemed a very long while to wait the necessary three months for an answer. I knew I had made an important discovery, and it seemed surely that someone must stumble onto it before I could get in from the other side of the world. I was away in the country when the answer might be expected. The coach that brought the mails used to appear on the skyline of the hill at four in the afternoon, and for many days I went to the post office hoping for the reply. At last it came, and all was well. How pleased I was. So that was the sort of equivalent at that time of having your first paper uh, published in Nature. Okay. Anyway, so I... Um, took my PhD uh, between 1961 and 1963, and just to sort of set the time frame, uh, you'll of course know that the myoglobin structure, the first structure, high resolution structure of a protein, uh, was published in 1960. So I began my thesis just shortly after um, that uh, publication uh, in Nature. Um, you might have expected that 
because I was at the University of Adelaide, because that was the uh, university at which Bragg, the father, had begun to establish his reputation and by now had the Nobel Prize, that that this would be a very, very active structural uh, crystallography group. That was not the case at all. They had very, very minimal research going on actually of any sort. Uh, my thesis, I had two thesis advisors for reasons I don't quite understand one of whom was Harry Medlin, who was a crystallographer. He had been a prisoner of war. Uh, actually, he was a student, uh, interrupted his studies, went off to the war, uh, was rounded up, uh, and spent three and a half years in a prisoner of war camp, was lucky to survive, came back, um, and he got me started, uh, as I'll describe in a moment, on a small molecule crystallography project. Also had help from Stan Tomlin, uh, who was really more of a biophysicist who worked on collagen. Now, since this is a Rigaku uh, seminar and since you're interested in uh, the production of x-rays, I thought I'd show the x-ray equipment that we actually use to collect the data uh, for my uh, thesis projects. And this monstrosity that you now see uh, was an x-ray generator that had been donated to the department by a company called BHP, the Broken Hill Proprietary Company. It's the biggest mining and manufacturing company in Australia. And they had used this generator, uh, for example, to uh, take x-rays of welded structures to check for defects and so on. And it was designed to use um, very uh, high voltage x-rays, but for very, very short periods, just for a tenth of a second or so. And anyway, they uh, had no use for it. They gave it to the department. And so we set about trying to adapt it uh, to generate x-rays for small molecule uh, x-ray data collection for which the generator needed to be run essentially 24 hours a day. And uh, so I had a lot of help from this Harry Medlin, one of my advisors. And uh, when you try to run this thing for more than a few seconds, various components would burn out. We had to gradually replace parts and eventually got this thing going. It had many idiosyncrasies. I can tell you, you see a notice right at the top where it says danger, uh, and those bare wires up there would have something like 60,000 volts. Um, anyway, it managed to uh, survive uh, using that thing, and on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see um, an old-fashioned Weissenberg camera, uh, which was used to collect the data on film, uh, and then you, by eye estimation, you estimated those intensities, uh, and use those to try to determine some small molecule crystal structure. Now, the actual structure that I had for my thesis project was uh, shown here. As you see, it had a total of uh, 14 atoms, one of which was sulfur. And the idea would be to, since the sulfur was slightly more electron dense than the rest of the structure, to try to uh, uh, find the position of the sulfur first and use that to bootstrap uh, the rest of the structure. I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, that approach. Um, now, the problem, well, let me first of all tell you how we calculated these uh, Patterson functions and Fourier functions at that time. So everything had to be done by hand. We had no uh, computers whatsoever. Um, and so what you're looking at uh, is a box of what were called beavers, lips, and strips. So there's maybe 7,000 little pieces of cardboard in this box. And each row of strips contains uh, a cosine function. So, for example, the first strip might be the cosine of 10x, as x runs from 0 to a quarter. Um, and then each individual strip, uh, the other strips, uh, would have a different amplitude. So the first strip might be cosine of 10x. Then the next one would be 2 cosine 10x. The next would be 3 cosine 10x, and so on. And so to calculate these Patterson or Fourier functions, again, you'll know it's a Fourier series, so you have to sum um, the various terms. And again, because it was all being done by hand, everything had to be done in projection. It was just not feasible to think about calculations uh, in three dimensions. And so to do the calculation in the first dimension, you would take um, a series of these uh, strips. You see they're here. Um, uh, different uh, cosine functions or maybe sine functions, uh, and then you vertically would sum each row uh, of these values, and you see my handwriting across the bottom where the various sums 
Um, and then going horizontally, the values would already be pre-summed. So the total would be written on the right-hand side. And if you hadn't made some stupid mistake, then the sum of all the values down the right-hand side should equal the sum of the uh, totals across the bottom. And that would check that you hadn't made a mistake. Obviously, if you made a mistake, you had to go back and resum and see where that mistake had occurred. So you would do this calculation, as I said, for example, in the x direction. And then there would be a second calculation that you would do uh, in the y direction. And you took a sheet of paper according to the geometry of the unit cell, ruled that up. You see again in my handwriting, you write the numbers on here for the electron density values, contour the thing by hand, and you hope that you'll see some atom that wasn't already in the model uh, and that will make the model better. Then you take that atom and do the inverse calculation. So calculating this sort of a map would take about three days and three nights of solid calculation. Uh, and then the inverse calculation would take another three days and three nights. Hopefully, the agreement between the uh, model uh, calculated uh, structure factors and the observed data would get better, and you would uh, cycle in and eventually determine the structure. Now, this procedure, in my case, depended on getting this uh, sulfur position correct. And at first, uh, I misinterpreted uh, that result. Um, and later, I, as I'll explain in a moment, I had to do further calculations to sort out what exactly was going on. So you see here um, two Patterson functions. So you're projecting, it's a standard Patterson function, but it's just projected on one face of the unit cell at the bottom and on a different face of the unit cell at the top. Um, and the squares here, these are the peaks that I assumed were arising from the sulfur-sulfur interaction. So there's one here. Uh, there's a very strong one up here, which was very, appeared to be very convincing. There should be one here that wasn't so great. But at any rate, that's how I started. Later on, I found the correct peak should have been um, here, here, here. OK. So in order to sort this out, I used an approach which no one thinks about these days, but which in those days the people used to uh, consider. And these were called generalized Patterson functions. So I th I'm assuming that the audience is pretty much all sort of crystallographic and, and knows about Patterson functions. So if you take, um, a, you know, this is now again a two dimensional Patterson function using the H0L reflections, that will give you an image of the vector peaks projected onto the XZ plane. Now, I can ask you, do you know? What would happen if you calculated a Patterson function just using this plane of data, the H1L reflections? This, again, is going to be projected on the same XZ surface. So what I'll tell you, and again, remember, we could only do calculations one projection at a time. Couldn't do a three-dimensional calculation. Uh, so for the H1 data, um, let me get this. Here you have uh, uh, the result of, of a Patterson function uh, on the projected on the XZ plane turns out to be similar to the H0L Patterson, except that the peak heights are multiplied by this modulating function, where Z1 minus Z2 is the difference in height between the two, matter, the two atoms of interest. So in my particular case, there was a a 2-1 screw axis in the B direction. And so therefore, the sulfur atoms, uh, the difference in the Z atoms uh, would necessarily be a half of a unit cell. So cosine of 2 pi multiplied by a half, that would be minus 1. So what you would expect is for the sulfur-sulfur peak, for the atoms that are related by the 2-1 screw axis, you should actually see a negative peak. So you calculate this H1L generalized Patterson function. And over here is a very, very strongly negative peak. Uh, and that turns out to be the vector peak between the two sulfur atoms related by the 2-1 axis um, half a unit cell apart, which gives you the uh, negative uh, value of the peak. Up here is a second expected peak. Uh, and these are, this is between two sulfur atoms. But these are not half a unit cell apart. And that's why uh, the, the value 
of Z and I'm having trouble with the pointer, here we come again. Here, in this particular case, uh, the difference in the Z value was such that, uh, that that peak was expected to be rather weak. But now you can continue and you can calculate an H2L Patterson function and now you expect that the peaks that are related by the 2, 1 square axis should actually be positive. So if you can keep your sort of keep this in mind where this negative peak was here and now we go to the H2L function, now we have a very strong peak so that's really nice confirmation that this indeed is the sulfur sulfur um, vector. So anyway that gave me the correct position for the sulfur atom, I could then pull out the rest of the structure and that was all very satisfying. Now up until this time uh, as I mentioned before we had no uh, computing uh, facilities whatsoever, but around this time, this is toward the third year of my thesis, uh, the university purchased an IBM 1620 computer. So as I remember, it had about 2,000 words of memory, um, and every Wednesday evening, uh, the physics department could have the use of that computer. And the physics department was me. I was the only person in the department who um, was either willing or able or wanted to use that computer. So I could go over maybe 6 o'clock in the afternoon, stay all night until people came in the next morning, uh, write programs and make use of that uh, IBM 6020 computer. Um, and I then uh, took on uh, a much more complicated structure, which is shown here. Altogether, uh, it had these uh, 46 atoms, uh, two of which were bromines. I could locate the bromine atoms. I couldn't really do, three, to do a two-dimensional calculation had to be split up into two parts. Again, you had to break it up, the summation in the first direction, summation in the second direction. Couldn't really do uh, bona fide three-dimensional calculations, but you could do special sections through three-dimensional data or line sections. Uh, worked out where the two bromines were, uh, used those to pull in the rest of the structure. So that was the last uh, chapter of my thesis, this um, much larger small molecule. But, but it, it actually wasn't that satisfying particularly. Uh, and I really wanted something uh, more challenging to do. I just didn't want to be continuing doing work similar to, to what I'd done to this point. And so, uh, colleague said to me that I might consider writing to uh, the MRC lab in Cambridge, which is where, of course, the myoglobin uh, structure had been determined. And I was fortunate enough to be offered a position there. I wrote specifically to Max Peretz, who was the director of the lab, and uh, he invited me to come and uh, work, uh, and I anticipated that I would be working with him uh, on his ongoing studies of hemoglobin. Um, took maybe six months to finish my thesis, got married, take the ship to England, uh, and eventually take up this position. And I want to show you this photograph that we took of the MRC lab in Cambridge um, at the time um, that I first, in fact, this is the week that we arrived in England. And the reason I'm showing you this photograph is that over on the left-hand side, you'll see the flag is flying at half-mast. And you probably do not know, maybe you know, that in England it's extremely rare um, for them to lower the Union Jack and, and fly it at half mast. You may remember that when Princess uh, Di died and the royal family would not lower the flag flying over Buckingham Palace, even though the general public was incensed about this and after several days essentially demanded that in respect for her, the flag should be fine. So eventually, uh, the royal family did agree to, to fly the flag in her honor. But this to, happens to be the week. The, the week we arrived in England was the week that John F. Kennedy was assassinated here in the States. Um, and in his honor, the um, Brits uh, flew the flag at, at half mile. So this was the end of uh, 1963. Now, as I mentioned, um, I expected um, when I was offered the position at the MRC to work with Max Perutz. When I went and talked to him, he told me that between the time that I had written and the time that I had arrived, that there were two other postdocs who had already 
uh, come. They had joined his group. They wanted to work with him. And he said that if indeed I still wanted to work with him, that would be okay. But why didn't I take some time and talk to other people in the lab and see if there was some other group that I might prefer to join? And in fact, I decided to work with David Blow. David Blow had been collaborating with Michael Rossman. Michael was just about to leave. Um, and David's project was structural studies of alpha chymotrypsin. Uh, he had a technician who was working with him. She was also about to leave. And so basically, David was at that point uh, by himself, had got crystals uh, of, of alpha chymotrypsin. I knew of some of his publications. Um, and we agreed that I would begin uh, to work with him on structural studies of alpha chymotrypsin. I show this next slide for two reasons, for three reasons, I guess. Um, one is you have a photograph of uh, David Blow on the left. Um, I'll come back to David Davies in a second. On the right-hand side, uh, David Phillips. And during the time that I was at the MRC, David Phillips came up from Oxford to give a talk about hen egg white lysozyme. Uh, so they had been working on structural studies of hen egg white lysozyme. And none of us knew, I'm sure Max Perutz knew, but the rest of us did not know that his group had actually determined the lysozyme structure. And so we were sitting there and he began to give this talk and as was customary in those days, the discussion was about problems with the data collection. There were two very similar but not identical uh, forms of the crystals. They had to sort that out. And, and as he proceeded into the talk, it, suddenly I realized that they had actually determined the structure of Henniguard lysosome. And I just remember sitting in that seminar room thinking, I'm sitting here and history is being made. This is the second structure of any protein, the first structure of an enzyme. And it was indicative that the structure of myoglobin wasn't just some fluke, that it was going to be possible to determine other protein structures. And of course, we now know that that's the case. But that was a very, very exciting and encouraging time. I should also say that those of us in David Blow's group actually went down to uh, Ox uh, went down to uh, London to practice uh, interpreting the electron density maps. It became clear that this was a recognition process that uh, it was very helpful to have had some experience. I include uh, David Davies here, and he was the person uh, with whom I spent a second postdoc uh, after working with uh, David Blow. This is shown, this is the group uh, that worked uh, on the chymotrypsin structure for most of the time that I was there, David Blow in the center. Uh, Paul Sigler, whom many of you know, uh, joined the group about six months to, uh, after uh, I uh, had arrived. And I show this slide also to make it clear that even though the MRC lab was the leading lab in the world by far in determining protein structures, nevertheless, the way it was done was still pretty primitive. So the chymotrypsin data were collected on film. And uh, over on the left-hand side here, you'll see um, this is a film densitometer. So you would take each film and scan sequentially, row by row by row. You would generate a trace. The heights of the peak would have to be measured. Over on the right-hand side, you see these endless boxes of computer cards, IBM uh, cards. So it was one card per reflection punched onto these cards, and we took these uh, boxes of uh, cards down to this IBM computer in London. But uh, I also want to acknowledge these four young ladies here. Um, and it sort of sounds sexist now, but these were called, quote, the computer girls. And these were actually smart, um, helpful young ladies who had to bear the brunt of, of measuring all these data and we try to give them some other things so they didn't go completely crazy. But they were essential uh, to slog through all the um, data collection for the chymotrypsin structure determination. And the structure was um, determined actually just shortly after I left the lab and published in uh, Nature uh, in 1967. The reason I show this particular slide, I want to um, bring your attention to the bottom. So the manuscript was received May 3, 1967. It was published 
10 days later, May 13, 1967. And so what I assume happened is that probably um, Max Perutz called the editor of Nature and said, um, David Blow's group has this structure, which I think uh, you would like to have published in Nature. The editor of Nature called up David Blow and said, if you can have a manuscript to us this week, I'll guarantee that it'll be published next week. Um, and so these were the times when it was good to be uh, a, a protein crystallographer. Getting stuff published in Nature was not a problem. Then went to um, David Davies' lab uh, at the NIH, and um, although the structure of chymotrypsin had been determined in, at the MSC in David Blow's lab, David was worried that there might have been errors in the interpretation of the map. So what we agreed to do was to take the same electron density map, we contoured it in a different way, uh, and then independently, or as independently as possible, uh, I rebuilt um, the model uh, of the alpha chymotrypsin structure uh, while working uh, as a postdoc in David Davies' lab. David uh, Davies had been working on gamma chymotrypsin, which we now know to be extremely similar to alpha chymotrypsin, um, and uh, therefore he had some interest in having uh, such a model in the lab, and it turned out this model was useful in subsequently uh, solving that structure. But from a personal point of view, you see me obviously on the left, um, it was really invaluable to have had that experience uh, in interpreting electron density maps uh, for uh, a couple of years later when I came to Eugene and we were working independently on the structure of thermolysin and other proteins. Um, so I'm actually getting close to the end of the time period that I want to uh, cover, but I thought I'd say a word about the origin of the so-called V sub M paper. So this is the paper in JMB which has a histogram which gives information about the likely solvent content uh, of protein crystals. And many, many people to this day, when they um, determine the first, that when they get the first crystals uh, of any protein, they'll check to see what is the likely number of molecules in the unit cell. And very kindly, they give a reference to this um, 1968 uh, JMB paper. Um, and by far, it's the most highly cited publication that, that I have. And what I have to admit is that it, it sort of happened as somewhat of an accident. Uh, and let me explain what the circumstances were. Now, during the time that I was a postdoc in Cambridge, uh, I remember David Blow came to me and said, um, you know, if you're going to be a protein crystallographer, you need to know how to crystallize proteins. Um, and so... We went upstairs, there was a Canadian by the name of Larry Smiley who was working on the sequence determination of a protein called chymotrypsinogen B. So the better known structure, the better known protein uh, is alpha chymotrypsin, but, uh, which is obtained from cows. Um, but when you get the um, sample, when you, when you go to the abattoirs and you collect the um, the, the source of alpha chymotrypsin, there are other zymogens, other related proteins that are there as well, one of which is chymotrypsinogen B, which has a sequence that's fairly closely related to that of alpha chymotrypsin or its precursor, chymotrypsinogen A. So Larry Smiley was uh, working up that sequence, um, uh, and uh, Brian Hartley, who was also at the MRC at that time, had fairly recently completed the, se completed the sequence of alpha chymotrypsin. So we asked Larry Smiley if he could let us have a sample of chymotrypsinogen B to try to grow crystals, and he went to the freezer, pulled out a large jar, um, and literally with a spoon and a beaker ladled me out probably 100 milligrams of this lyophilized protein and said, here you are, you know, take it away, go for it. So again, it was easy to get large quantities of proteins in those days, at least ones that were easy to, uh, to, 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 to obtain. And uh, so I took this material and quite quickly uh, obtained two perfectly good crystal forms um, of the protein. 
uh, which in principle would have been useful for a structure determination if, if we had wanted to pursue that. But the, the, the object really was to see if the protein could be crystallized. Anyway, I didn't do anything more with that until I was about to leave the MRC lab, go to David Davies' lab, and David Bo said to me, you know, he said, since I had crystallized this protein, that I should write a short note, just a report at least, that these crystals had been obtained. And he said it was, I had done it, he wasn't interested. He said, no, it's my work that he shouldn't be a co-author. And so I wrote a very short note, uh, which I submitted to Acta Crystallographica with these two, uh, two or three crystal forms of um, this chymotrypsinogen B. And it was common at that time that you would measure the density of the crystals and you would use the density to determine how many molecules in the unit cell. In my case, um, I was by now in uh, Bethesda in the United States. I didn't have the crystals. Um, so I did a quick survey of the literature to look for related, potentially related uh, crystals of other proteins uh, to see, based on comparison with other proteins, uh, probably how many molecules there were in the unit cell. And in the, the short note, which was no more than a page, uh, that I had submitted to Acta Crystallographica, I said something like, based on comparison with other protein crystals, there appear to be, uh, it was either one or two, but the number of molecules in the uh, asymmetric unit of the crystals. And whoever the referee was, I don't know, did not like that at all. And so the referee said, what right do you have to make this statement that just based on other protein crystals that the number of molecules in the unit cell is whatever I had said. And uh, so I thought, ah, oh, well, maybe what I should do is to be a bit more systematic about this. So I thought I decided then to do a complete survey of any protein, all the crystals, all the protein crystals uh, that I could find. And I did all that and made the graph, and then I thought, well, since I've done this, it became clear to me right away that this might be something that would be of general use, and therefore that I should write that up separately. And so I withdrew the original publication from um, Acta Crystallographica, and then resubmitted it um, in a slightly modified form to the Journal of Molecular Biology, and that's the article that you see in front of you, some crystal forms of bimine carbonatrogenogen B, arguably the least cited publication um, that I've ever written. And then back to back with that, um, this summary of the solvent content uh, of protein crystals, um, which, uh, as I said, and I'm sure this is the contribution which most of you will know. So I have to thank some anonymous reviewer out there for giving me a bad time. And I guess all I can say is that if you ever have comments from a reviewer and you feel they're unjustified or unfair, the reviewer might actually be doing you a big favor. So just keep that uh, in mind. Uh, so anyway, thank you for your interest. That's really uh, all that I wanted to say, except that I really have had the benefit uh, of terrific people uh, with whom to work. Uh, as I mentioned, Stan Tomlin and Harry Madeline were uh, my thesis advisors, David Blow, uh, with whom we did the alpha chymotrypsin structure at the MRC, David Davies, um, uh, who is a good friend and, 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 and mentor to this day. And all of these individuals were extremely uh, generous and supportive uh, to me. So really very, very fortunate to have a good start and uh, no complaints about what's happened since then. So thank you for your interest. That's really all that I wanted uh, to say, and I'd be glad to try to answer any questions. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Brian. That was a great presentation. Um, I'm sure at the, you know, at the time when you're when you're going through that, did you did you ever feel at the time that that you were making history and and developing a field? Y yes and no. Uh, so at that time, um, at least speaking for myself, I was not at first bothered about going somewhere where one could do something really important that somewhere where there was some project set up where you could already step in and you knew that there was going to be a publication in Nature or a publication in Cell. I mean, to the contrary, the general expectation was that anyone who's got any sense won't, would not get into 
protein crystallography or macromolecular crystallography because the chance of actually having anything to show for your time was almost minimal. Um, and so at that time, uh, sort of getting recognition of that sort was just was not a, a particular factor. I, I, and I think now times have changed and people like to go somewhere where they feel confident they're going to do something uh, very important. But on the other hand, I think there, there have been a couple of occasions where maybe I've done something and I thought, yes, this could be uh, quite important. And I remember particularly, I didn't talk about later work we did here in Eugene, but we determined the structure of the so-called CRO, CRO, CRO repressor protein, and we obtained the electron density map, and I remember looking at it, and there were these two parallel alpha helices that were uh, 38 angstroms apart, and 38 angstroms is the distance from one major groove to the next major groove uh, in Watson Crick uh, double-stranded DNA. And I looked at that structure and I thought, that structure is going to fit perfectly into the grooves of DNA. And that was a time where I thought, yeah, this could be quite important. Uh, and there, for a little while, it began to appear that maybe, maybe all DNA binding proteins would have that motif. As we now know, that's not the case, but that was one indication. That was one time where we did something. I thought, you know, my group is the only place in the world that knows about this particular result, and this could be important. So it was. There was a time when that happened once. Very interesting. Um, so what I'd like to do now is to open it up for uh, questions, and uh, so feel free to ask Brian a question. You can enter that into your chat area. And when you do so, if you, uh, if you have audio capabilities, if you'd let me know, and I'd be happy to ask on your behalf if you, haven't, if you don't have that uh, built into your uh, webinar presentation today. And then also just let me know if you have, um, if, if it'd be okay to use your, your first name if I ask on, on your behalf. Um, I have another quick question that, or uh, maybe a comment rather, but and it's, it's really, part of it is drawn off of your, you know your story about the JMB article and how that came to be, and and then also thinking about a lot of your work in lysozyme, and and one of the things that I, I see is quite unique, and and one of the things that you've definitely offered to the field of protein crystallography is a way of looking at different problems in, a, in such a systematic way, and really pulling apart the pieces to to get at really some of the basic truths or a, a better understanding for those types of things, and I think that that sometimes that's uh, it's kind of hard to see the forest for the trees, and especially when you have such a large task at hand. And so, uh, I think that's a that's that's definitely a, a trend in your research, and it's it's definitely been it benefited many crystallographers. Well, um, I, mm -hmm. let, let me just make a comment about that. So, I, I I appreciate your comment, and I would say, first of all, with respect to the uh, lysosome project, I think we were really fortunate in that um, we had determined the structure of that protein um, because we were interested in questions of protein stability and folding and in the early days we had made just randomly uh, selected mutants and then when it was possible to make directed mutants um, I had Tom Alber among others but people in the group that were very quick to bring together the possibility of making mutants, um, purifying those proteins, getting the crystal structures, and also doing stability studies and put that whole package together so it became possible in a systematic way to try to understand uh, questions about how individual amino acids contribute to protein stability and folding. So that was a, a fortunate thing. But also, I think when I, when I listen to people give talks and when I give talks myself, I try to keep it understandable. What bothers me is when people uh, give a talk and they want to include every experiment they've done, they want, to, uh, they want to include a lot of details, and I would much prefer, um, and this is true both in writing and in giving talks, to try to decide what are the most important issues and try to present them in a clear, straightforward, hopefully, uh, believable sort of way. So th I think that really is important. I think doing research is obviously interesting and critical, but equally important is to communicate those results to the rest of the um, of the world in a in a straightforward, clearly understandable way. A very good point. Um, I have a question here. This is um, from fellow Dr. Uh, Koppel. I'm going to pass this to Mike. He has a 
Are, are you speaking to me? I, I can't hear. Uh, yes. Hi, Brian. This is Mike. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, your voice is extremely faint. Okay, I'll try to talk louder. I was just wondering, with all the recent advancements... With Could, I, I'm sorry, it's, it's very, very faint. I can hardly hear at all. People were more involved with their experiments when you could really get your hands dirty when it comes to yourself. Are you there? Yeah, well, I'm here, but yeah. and, and but I can hear someone speaking about far, uh, far away. It's extremely okay. weak. Okay. Sorry about that, Brian. I'll try this again. I was just wondering, with all the recent advancements in computers and automated data collection that have come about in the last few years, do you ever miss the days when a scientist was more involved in their experiments and they could really get their hands dirty when it came to doing the work? Yeah, I, I really do. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, collecting data by film was, in, in many ways, it was a slog and you could say it was boring, but you did have time to think about other things. So in, while you were waiting for, you know, these exposures would take 24 hours or something. Um, and so you, you did have time to think. And, and, and also, another thing I miss is that in the early days, the field was pretty small. So you, you more or less knew everyone personally. You knew what they were doing. It took quite a while for structures to happen. And I mean, now, um, you know, once you get crystals, you can have a structure, in many cases, almost instantaneously. So, you know, you can be blindsided in that you invest quite a bit of time and effort in some project, and then here comes some other group that you weren't aware of at all that is doing the same thing. We were certainly there was competition, that's for sure. Um, but it, it, the, the whole pace of things was was more leisurely, and no, I do miss that somewhat. That's true. Uh, thanks, Brian. So we have a question. I'm going to, I hope I say this name correct, correctly. It's Balas Subramanian. Um, the question here is, how concerned are you about the automation of protein crystallography these days? I'm not, I'm not too concerned. Um, I think that um, in the days when I started, it was sufficient to be a good crystallographer. Um, and also, pretty much any structure that you were lucky enough to determine was of interest. But that's not the case at all. I mean, now, necessarily, the emphasis to choose some study which is of biological interest and to focus on that, and I think that many people are, let's say, primarily trained as molecular biologists or chemists or whatever, and that they use crystallography as a tool, and I, and I think that's good. Now, there are cases where people have got structures wrong, and, and that's worrisome. Um, so you have to hope that um, people at least know enough about crystallography not to ignore uh, warning signs uh, if there's some, you know, they have some model of a structure and, 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 and it seems not to be consistent with the data. So that is somewhat of a worry. But I think the more important thing is that these days, you have to be more of a generalist. You have to know crystallography, among other tools, I think. That's very true. Um, and, you know, that begs the question, there's, uh, if you talk to many at meetings, there's a big emphasis on crystallographic education, in yes. a sense, and uh, and the other techniques that you must know. And, and uh, it, it just seems like that you can be spread quite a bit, quite thin on the number of techniques you have to have under your in your tool belt, basically, to get the answers question, the questions answered for, for your particular project. And so in terms of what is your advice for uh, crystallographic education, whether in an academic setting or someone who's a graduate student who may be listening today who would like to know the best avenue for le learning crystallography? Um, well, you know, I would have, I guess my personal feeling is that there's no substitute for being, you know, to actually um, spending some time in a lab um, which has a lot of experience in crystallography, has people in the group that know crystallography. Of, of the people that have joined my group, uh, certainly in the, early, in the early days, almost all were what I would call card-carrying crystallographers. And then as time went on, I would have people who would write to me and say, they would say, well, I'm a biochemist or I'm a molecular biologist, but I really would like to learn something 
about crystallography and these people would jo join the group and hopefully they'd actually be involved with solving a structure and, and those people have gone on and, and done terrific things and, and I think that's great. But I also know, I, I mean that, and I'm sure you know too, that the people at Cold Spring Harbor run this uh, much more abbreviated course and what I'm told is that Rod McKinnon went to that course and learned enough crystallography to solve some very, very interesting structures. So, um, you know, I, I think things can be done with a short-term course, but I, I guess my gut feeling is that it, 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 I don't know if it's a really complete substitute for just working in a lab and interacting on a more extended basis with different people working on different projects um, and, and, and getting a, a bit more extensive experience. I, I think from from teaching uh, crystallography, so for many years I taught a, a one-term crystallography course which was essentially how to solve crystal structures and the emphasis was more on small molecule structures but including something about proteins and at the end of that lab we would do, uh, we would actually go into the lab and the students would take a crystal and collect data and and it was, the, the, uh, the particular example actually was the crystal structure of urea and I don't know how many of the group know anything about the crystal structure of urea but it's a really, really fun small molecule uh, project just to take a urea crystal determine the unit cell and the space group and it's quite interesting the way you have to determine the space group. It turns out to be uh, ambiguous but if you use the uh, known uh, structure or the expected structure of urea you can actually in effect work out the whole crystal structure just by thinking about the symmetry of the molecule and the space group symmetry. So that would be the project that the students would do and I can't tell you how many students at the end of that would say that's a really really fun project and would feel that they had learned something. So um, I, I, I think that, uh, and that was a one-term course, so my personal feeling is it's hard to teach crystallography, let's say, in three uh, one-hour lectures. I just think that's sort of a bit impossible. You get a, an impression, but but not real working practical knowledge. I would, I would definitely agree with that. Um, there's a follow-up question that uh, Bala Subramanian had, and he, um, his comment, he, he said, thank you very much for the answering this question, and that there are many simulation techniques based on crystal structures and uh, that are used to make and publish uh, conclusions. And what would your comment be on, on those types of um, tools or people doing that sort of work, modeling, essentially? Yeah. Um... I I think that um, using, for example, homology modeling is great as a way to design experiments, but there are limitations as well. And so, as you may know, I'm editor of uh, the journal Proteins, and we do get a number of manuscripts based on different sorts of molecular dynamic simulations, homology modeling, and the sort of the journal has a criterion that these approaches need to have some, provide some sort of biological insights. So, as I said, I think that uh, if, you, if you have a related structure, you use that to predict the structure of your favorite protein, and in turn use that to design mutations that either modulate binding of some ligand or inactivate the enzyme, check about the mechanism. I think that's great, and that's so that the um, homology modeling should go hand in hand with experiments designed upon the homology model. But just to just do homology modeling or molecular dynamics uh, sort of per se, um, I think you do have to be fairly careful in what you uh, conclude from those uh, results. Again, um, it's re closely related to how, whether, how well or otherwise we can um, predict protein structures and I think there's been a lot of progress, but um, actually predicting a structure from the sequence is still hard, and I think we still have a way to go. Uh, thank you. Um, we have a question from Kiting, and uh, who's asking if you could comment on how the process of selection, selecting target proteins for study, and how you might go about doing that, for example. You mean uh, to 
select a protein that's biologically interesting? Is that what you mean? Correct. All right. I'm guessing that, um, let's say if you were starting from scratch and you were looking around for a target uh, to study, a target protein for for atomic, you want to do an atomic resolution structure, how might you go about that process? And I, I'm sure that many of it is just comes with the, what's the, being studied within the lab of that you go to. Right. So that's a, that's a really hard a question to answer, I think, um, and I would say that um, hopefully people would begin to think about those sorts of issues at the time that they're a student or a postdoc, and that assuming that they're interested in some general area, some class of membrane proteins, or uh, I don't know whether it's protein folding or whatever, but try to go to a lab which is actively working in that area, not necessarily using uh, crystallography right away, but at least to get you have to get background about about different areas. And I think it's quite hard to do that just from reading the literature or going to seminars. You can occasionally you'll go to a seminar and say that's a really interesting area, it's a new area, maybe that's an area in which I could begin to move. But it's it's hard, and I don't have any really strong and good suggestions as to how to how to do that to judge also between <clears throat> what's interesting um, but also what's reasonably feasible you can't you, know, it's just, you don't want to choose a project which is enormously interesting but on the other hand um, for some technical reason uh, it's going to be extremely difficult to apply crystallography so I, I really I'm sorry but I don't have any great great uh, solutions to that I, th I think what you're what you're saying is is absolutely true, and you know, and I, I am just meeting uh, colleagues in the field today. You know, I know some that are in in laboratories are working on extremely difficult uh, projects, and may, they they know from the outset that it's gonna it's gonna take a very long time, and that their contribution maybe to the total picture may be actually quite small, but the investment that they make in the number of years is 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 quite significant and then there are other places that you go to where projects can sometimes fall out quite quickly and one thing that I think that is that is common to all of them is they have a really strong interest in the in the system that they're studying and you know and I think that if you have that that core interest and you're working hard and you feel like each day you go in you're making a contribution it's it's more of a philosophical type thing as well and and like you're saying, whether it's accomplishable within within the time frame that you have. Right. So well, that's also where the knowledge of um, molecular biology and related techniques is important. So if you're you're particularly interested in some protein, you purify that protein, you give it your best shot, and it doesn't crystallize, and then you begin to think, well, is there some related protein that might be better behaved, a protein from a thermophile or uh, a, a protein about which more or less is known, but to use use different um, variants of the protein to to try to still uh, get something that will eventually lead to a structure. A very good point. We have a question from Randy, and uh, his question is, "How does I guess it could be he or she?" So my uh, my apologies. Uh, Randy wants to know how would a small molecule crystallographer make the jump to protein crystallography. Um, so there are some people that just uh, had a lot of experience um, working on small molecules and then just made that transition. I mean, um, Lyle Jensen in Seattle did that years ago. Bill Lipscomb at Harvard did that. Um, and, and so that has happened. But again, I, I think if you're a small molecule person and you wanted to make that transition, what I would really try to do would be to organize to spend at least a little while in someone's lab that's doing uh, macromolecular crystallography. I, I mean, I think these days, again, if you have all the crystallography techniques, it doesn't take that long uh, to sort of uh, learn the extra information that, that you have to have. But again, there's a lot of little small things that are quick and easy to pick up if you're just watching someone else doing uh, macromolecular crystallography that you might miss if you're strictly a small molecule person. So I would say, if, if possible, just try to, and it need not be very long, but just to organize a, st a short period uh, in um, 
a, a, a macromolecular lab and also hopefully with someone who would be sympathetic to you know what you want to learn during that period. Um, our next question is um, is about uh, is from Brian. Brian is a regular uh, visitor to the webinars, and his question is he wanted to know if you would speak about the importance for networking for today's crystallographer and whether you had any tips tips that you could share. Um, do you, I'm not quite I think sure. you mean like professional networking as far as you know building a network of colleagues. I'm thinking that's I'm I'm pretty sure he's not talking about, you know, networking computers and things of that nature, but my guess is professional networking and develop, you know developing collaborators and things of that nature, I guess. Yeah, I mean no, so I I I I do think that that's um important and something that you should try to do that if you can, if you have the opportunity um, to to go to meetings or one way or another uh, to uh, just simply to get to know other people in the field um, that first of all uh, there may be um, students or postdocs in one lab and if they learn about another lab and they might be more interested to apply for a position there so to the extent that you you have other people that know you, they may suggest that their students should go to your group or a postdoc may go to your group. So I think in that sense, um, it's it's helpful. Um, if something happens of interest, uh, then maybe a friend would send you information. So you just tend to be more aware of of, of what's going on. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I I I think that's. That's very useful, and, and and people should try to do that insofar um, as they can. I think there's nothing to be uh, lost, and maybe um, a lot to be gained from that. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have I'm gonna have, we have time for one more question, and this question is going to be from a mayor, and uh, it's he's asking, uh, do you think there's a future for de novo protein structure determination, given what we've learned about protein structures in the last few decades? By de novo, this person means using direct methods. I'm using high resolution yeah. data and direct methods. Is that, is that the question? Yeah, yeah. For you know, de novo. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that's a very, very interesting and intriguing uh, area. There was a um, a postdoc in my group, uh, Blaine Moores, who's now in Oklahoma, and he was particularly interested in doing that, and actually um, had some substantial success in solving um, pretty large. Um, protein, uh, uh, let me rephrase that, as protein structures they were not enormous but they were significant size um, proteins by direct methods in the case where you have very very high resolution data and uh, in his case to show that if you happen to have uh, a slightly heavier atom or a couple of heavier atoms that really uh, makes those approaches more powerful. So I think first of all just on sort of theoretical and technical grounds I think it's really interesting um, the, you know, to, to, to the extent that you can continue to advance those methods and maybe also that if this is um, a way to get more very very high resolution structures in the database I think that there's a tendency to solve a protein structure at reasonable resolution move on but there's also a need for really really high resolution accurately determined uh, uh, protein structures as well, and that would be a byproduct, I think, uh, of structures that are, um, uh, are solved by um, by direct methods. So I, I'm enthusiastic about that. Um, and if you're lucky enough to have a, uh, uh, you crystallize a protein and it diffracts extremely well, so here's a vehicle to uh, look into using those methods rather than just do the standard uh, sort of more old-fashioned ways. So I think absolutely go for it. That's great. Thank you very much, Brian. So with that, I'd like to wrap up today's, uh, today's webinar. And, uh, and definitely thank you very much for taking time to, to talk to us today. I know uh, it was very informative for me and hopefully for, for everyone else in attendance. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay. You're very, very welcome. All right.